everyone. Welcome back to Brunch with Brent. I'm super excited today. I'm tempted to say extra excited today to be joined by Peter Adams. Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Super excited to chat with you. Great. Welcome. Welcome to brunch. Um, I am extra excited, like I was saying, to have you join me for this conversation you're bringing together two of my very deep passions. One is open source technologies and ideas, and the other one is photography. And of course, we're going to dive into how that uh, comes into your life. You know, I'm just talking about those two juxtapositions, and and it's making me smile like crazy. So um, thank you for being the embodiment of that excite excitement. <laughs> <laughs> happy happy to embody that. Two two of my favorite things as well. So. Yeah, which is really cool. And uh, the way I discovered some of your work was that uh, Cheese, one of our friends and host at Jupiter Broadcasting, he mentioned one of your projects, which is the Faces of Open Source, which is a photography project that you're doing uh, and have been doing for a while. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? So I started that project, God, back in 2014, 2015. Okay. And, you know, it's a portrait project. Um just basically photographing and exploring the open source community, people, people in the open source community. And my whole feeling was that open source often kind of gets relegated to these bizarro program names or acronyms or <laughs> there are a few of those, right? <laughs> yeah. There's a couple, couple million acronyms in the open source world. But you, ne you know, it's it, finding the faces of the people and bringing a human element and really sort of seeing the community visually um, is not something that's that's super easy to do. It's super easy to browse GitHub pages. It's super easy to get on a mailing list. It's very hard to put a face with a name. And as a photographer, that really bugged me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so I just dove in and started um, doing portraits of notable and unsung faces in the open source community. Um, people, some, some people I sought out are, are fairly well known, uh, but many of them are not. Many of them are, are new to open source. Um, many of them have played a critical role, but have been a little bit more unsung in the history books. Right. And so I really wanted to sort of create a collection uh, that was representative of the community and and that people could see who these who the faces that are creating this amazing community and this amazing software who they who they were, and so I started that you know in 2015, and we're up over 100 portraits at at this point. Um, I think it's 120 something. What a wonderful feat! Like that, 100 portraits for you know for for any professional photographer who's you know really put their heart into a single portrait doing a hundred is no small thing. Yeah. It's, it's been, um, it's been a really, you know, it's been a great journey and, and it's a project, you know, that I have to fit in between other, other work and other projects. And sometimes I get lucky and, you know, I'll go to a conference and there's a whole bunch of people that are, you know, that I'm wanting to photograph that are at that conference. But oftentimes it's me loading the car and showing up at somebody's backyard or somebody's living room or somebody's front yard. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or, or, or office, you know, cram, cram all the gear into a conference room and just kind of go from there. But, you know, and, and that's been the hardest part of the project is just the logistics of getting people scheduled because as much as, you know, there's a, there's a good concentration of people in California where I am, but um, a lot of people are, are, are all over the map and I get to New York a lot. We've done a lot of shoots in New York as well for people, but, you know, I have to try to time when people are traveling to the U S maybe they're going to be in the same city I'm going to be in. Um, or maybe I can extend a trip on another project to photograph them for this project. So the logistics part has been, has really been the, the, the hardest part of getting, you know, getting to 120 you know, plus people at this point. And I, last year we did, I think 18 or 19, the year before that I did 30. So it's really, it really depends kind of on, you know, how, the, how logistics and schedules kind of align, how many more people we add. And do you have someone kind of helping you 
both on the logistics and, uh, you know, connecting with people and also on site when you're actually taking the photographs? Well, on site, you know, if I can, I'll have an assistant with me, but oftentimes, you know, these are, these are fairly, um, fairly simple shoots and it's just me and, and a, and a car full of equipment. If we're shooting in a studio, I'll, I'll tend to have an assistant, you know, help with, you know, set up or, or things like that. But, but it's, it's really just me. I mean, I'm logistically, I'm approaching people and reaching out, writing people. Um, everybody gets a random email from, from this, this random photographer saying he's doing a project. Um, but actually, you know, at this point, a lot of participants have been really great because they're referring me to other people or they've been really gracious with their time and they've kind of opened their Rolodex. So they make introductions, um, to other people in the community on my behalf. And that's been, that's been really helpful and really, really amazing, um, that people are willing to do that and, and see the project, you know, grow and be successful through those introductions. It has been so cool for me to see some of these portraits. Uh, I mostly have, well, I've, I've mostly taken them in from your website and it's true what you're saying. Like we know maybe a handful of popular faces, you know, the Linuses and such, but there are so many sort of intriguing looking people there that you just kind of want to click on and, and learn their story as well. I have really appreciated that connection of the visual and the, the sort of people side of things connected with the story uh, where you're a little bit more familiar with, you know, the, the code they wrote or the project they worked on for decades or something like that. And um, has it kind of surprised you sometimes when you get to meet some of these people? Like, oh, they're not, um, you know, the image that you may have made in your mind because we all do. Or uh, how has that experience been sort of meeting all these people? I mean, the experience of meeting everybody has been has been amazing. It's been phenomenal just being able to spend time. I mean, sometimes I, I get an hour, um, with somebody. Sometimes I I only get, you know, a few minutes with somebody. So, but all the times, you know, I do, you know, before every shoot, I, I do my research and, you know, I get online and I read, you know, extensively about what they've done and their history and their background and, you know, if they've done any other interviews. So I, I research, I kind of know, you know, something about the person, at least their public persona, um, by the time they show up on my set, but you never really can get a handle on somebody's personality until they're in front of your camera and you're face to face. And in some cases, yeah, it's been, it, it, I've been pleasantly surprised, you know, 99% of the time, <laughs> nice. um, you know, the, the few, you know, a couple uh, curveballs here and there, but, uh, f- but for the most time, everybody in this community has been really wonderful and really gracious with their time and, and really excited to participate in a project like this. Um, and I think that, you know, at this point with, with it going on for a number of years now, I will get, you know, I will get notes, um, you know, from past participants that have been following, you know, the project for a few years or, or, or people that have just, you know, have seen it kind of evolve over the years and, and people have been really encouraging, you know, encouraging me to keep going and, and, and are really appreciative that there's a, there's a documentation of this community because there really hasn't been. And that, that was something that was so fascinating to me when I was doing the research on, you know, on this project was that this is such an important thing. Open source is such an important phenomena. And there's just, there's very little photographic documentation of the people, you know, that have created this. I mean, you know, there's, there's tons of photos of Tim Berners-Lee and Vin, Vin Cerf and, you know, all, you know, the, the, the mega, you know, stars of, of the, of the, you know, internet and the web and, you know, these, these massive, you know, projects. Of course. And Linus has a lot of photos. There's actually a funny story about Linus when I photographed him. <laughs> oh, I like funny stories. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll never forget it because, you know, I was, you know, I was concerned, you know, Linus is, you know, you know, Linus is Linus. He's yeah. larger, larger than life figure in the, in the community and, and, um, and confrontational at the same time, you know, or controversial, I should say, maybe confrontational on, on mailing lists, but, you know, slightly controversial. And I just, you know, I had never met him before and, 
you know, I didn't, I didn't really, you know, how sensitive he was going to be to, to be photographed, but he agreed, you know, very, very quickly and was very, was very happy and accommodating, you know, for our, for our sitting. And, um, you know, at, at the end, I make everybody sign a, sign a release, you know, a photo release of, as I'm sure you do when you do your shoots, you know, I asked him if he had any issue signing that and his, his, his note, his, his response to me was, have you seen the pictures of me on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh man, that's so, it's, it's so refreshing <laughs> that, you know, most people are so concerned with, with images and their photography is being used. And, you know, I had done the photo research of him and, you know, there's, there's, you can just go to Google images and see some, some pretty funny pictures of him, you know, giving the finger to people and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's, but he was super accommodating and and really um, really generous with his time at at a busy conference, um, you know, to take take the time and do a sitting with me. So that was that was really fun. Yeah, I think as as you certainly know, since you've been doing photography for a long while, and I certainly know because I am a professional photographer as well. Um, there's this real opportunity when you get to do a portrait of someone. Uh, it ends up you know, if no one's ever had a professional portrait done, um, it's quite an intimate experience. And if you're with a great photographer, they will make that intimate experience a positive thing, uh, you know, make you feel the most comfortable you possibly can. Um, and that can lead to some really fast connections, uh, some really deep connections as well within, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes. Um, so I imagine for you and, and maybe even f for those you're photographing that uh, it's kind of nice to have some of those discussions, you know, at a busy conference, but you're, you're, you're going away into, I'm assuming a room or something like that and just having a bit of a breather and a, and a really important connection. So has that been a nice portion of it, of it for you? Just like having that intimate time with some of these people? Oh yeah. I mean, and, and what an honor to be able to get that. I mean, you know, uh, most of these people are uh, on planes, you know, 24 seven and, you know, between projects and their day job. And then, you know, the conference circuit, I mean, the, the life of an open source advocate is, is quite, is quite busy actually is what <laughs> I've learned. Um, right. You know, I never know, you know, some, some people it, it's taken me years to schedule. We've literally, I, I have email threads, you know, that go, for multiple years trying to find the overlap and schedules and, you know, trying to get somebody um, to be in the same place that I'm going to be, or for me to be in the same place they're going to be. And um, it's, it's very difficult. So when I do get them in front of the camera, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it is an intimate thing. And I think most people have not had their portrait done before. And I always ask people when I photograph them, if they've had their portrait taken before, you know, not like a not a corporate headshot type portrait, but like, have they ever really been in a portrait sitting? And, and it's, it's very rare for somebody to have had that experience. And I think, you know, as you know, it takes a little while to get past the, you know, the discomfort of being in front of a camera. And, and my sets tend to be, you know, pretty elaborate. I mean, if we're shooting in a, in a studio, you know, it's a full on photo studio and, you know, these, these are, these are all portraits on white. So it's, you know, so you're shooting with more than one light sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's six lights and five C stands and flags. And, you know, it's a whole, it's a, it's an involved, it's an involved lighting setup to do these portraits. Um, so, you know, I think, and some people have never been on, you know, professional photo shoot before they've never been on set before. So, you know, it takes a little while to try to, you know, get people into the zone and, and have them settle. Yeah, that setup alone can be intimidating, right? Yeah, it's just you know, it's 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 a lot for somebody to just walk into if they've never if they've never experienced it before. Um, but then you know, you know, then people you know typically you know relax and and you find you find the rhythm and you find the flow and and you develop the connection and and the photos come from that. Well, you know, you made me smile and laugh actually when we first connected on the phone. Um, to set up this conversation, uh, because one of the first things you did, and and I I bet you didn't even consciously realize you did this, um, 
But one of the first things you did was ask me about five to seven questions about me just to kind <laughs> of, you know, we were developing a connection, which is important, but I was like, aha, uh -huh, this is exactly what I do to other people when I'm, you know, setting them up for a portrait or, but that's just become my personality is I've become really curious about people and you were doing that to me. And I was like, oh, I see. We're two photographers <laughs> sitting in the same room here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, if people are going to listen to this, I'm like, I didn't get one answer out of either of them because they were so busy asking each other questions. <laughs> no, that's just what we have to do. I mean, that's that's how you learn. I mean, I think, I mean, for me at least, that's why, that's why I pick up the camera, you know, is to have that experience to to connect with somebody, to learn something about another person and and to have that connection and of course the art that comes out of it is is very satisfying but the process of getting to that art and learning about the person and learning about their experiences is you know i think that's why a lot of people become photographers because that's what they that's what they want to be doing with their life. They want to be learning in a continual, continually learning, essentially. You're describing me right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> and photography, certainly for me, and I imagine for you as well, has allowed me to spend time in environments that otherwise I would never, ever have access to, right? Like, for instance, for you, this project is allowing you access to people you would likely otherwise never talk to in a in hundred years, right? Totally. But there's something about photography's ability to connect people and allow you to experience other people's lives in a deep, meaningful way for an afternoon or, you know, a few minutes even. Uh, that is one of the most exciting things to me. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a passport, you know, that uh, a, 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 a secret kind of passport that, you know, not everybody has. And, you know, it gives you that entree, um, you know, it just into these experiences that you're looking to have, or you're looking to, you know, get access to. Um, and it's amazing, you know, I, you know, I do a lot of personal projects and I'm always shocked, you know, when I come up with an idea for a personal project, you know, like, like faces of open source or, or another one of my projects. And, you know, when you're first doing the research, you're always thinking to yourself, oh man, am I, am I, is this ever going to happen? Is, some, is, is anyone ever going to say yes to this project? <laughs> Are they really going to let me in there with my camera to do X, Y, and Z? And I always think, you know, there's no way it's never going to happen. And then you write the email and somebody comes back and they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Or yeah, I'll give you that access. And it's amazing how many, how welcoming people are. Um, you know, with the right project in the right context, um, the camera is really is sort of a passport into, into these other worlds and situations. And yet with that passport comes a lot of responsibility, right? If you're given this access and you kind of don't respect it, that does a real disservice to everyone. And so I feel like you, you kind of take on this really important role in, in nurturing the people you're also running into. That's clearly gotten you more and more yeses as you dive into people's networks, right? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's a it's a huge responsibility, and 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 I think that's also where the the perfectionists, you know, a lot of photographers I find are are perfectionists as well, because <laughs> you know, then you get this access, you you've you've done all this this legwork to get to the place where you can photograph somebody, and you want to do the best job that you could possibly do every single photograph, every single sitting, every single subject, you want to make sure that you're doing your best on behalf of that person and, and doing the sitting justice because the photographs are, are hopefully going to live on. And, you know, this is, this is a super important, you know, topic or project that you're spending time on. You, you want to make sure it's the best that it could ever be. So you go the extra mile and you knock yourself out every time because that's the that's the quid pro quo of of getting access is that you're going to give it 150 percent every time i'm sitting here nodding profusely at all your words like yep that's how you <laughs> need to do it and so now that you have you know 100 plus photographs uh under your belt for this specific project um I guess what do you where are you hoping that they live long term you know is there a place you'd like to give 
the greater public access to them or some kind of access from the open source community? Like what, what do you see as the end goal? Well, I, you know, I, th I think originally when I started the project, I thought, um, you know, if I can get access to, you know, a, a representative enough group of the, you know, within the community that it would be, it would be a great book. And so I'm, I've been trying to get a book, you know, together and design a book and, and get it out, you know, seriously for the last year. And, you know, it's just been lots of life getting in the way of that. Yeah. And a book is no small thing to do well, you know. Exactly. Exactly. So ultimately, I, I really do want to do that. I think that, you know, being able to sit down with a book and look at the photographs, um, you know, in person and in a, in a large size as well is really appealing and impactful. And, you know, I think that that's going to be the most accessible way for people to physically get, kind of get their hands on the photographs. I, but I think, you know, because it's open source and so much of open source is, I mean, online and it's just the website is going to be really the focal point of the project over time. Mm -hmm. I have done some exhibits like this last year, we exhibited all the photos at OSCON in uh, the OSCON conference in Portland. Nice. And, you know, these are, you know, sort of, you know, short exhibits in the sense that, you know, OSCON is really, you know, a little less than a week. So we do these digital exhibits on, you know, these on, you know, monitors and a portrait orientation and, and it looks really good and it's really, it's really impactful. And it's an, it's a nice way to do very short-term exhibits. Um, I would like to exhibit the prints just because I do all the prints myself and I, I love printing. So, um, you know, be an excuse to, to be able to sort of hunker down and, and, you know, do some, some exhibition quality printing, but that's a, that's sort of a major undertaking. I have to find the right it has to be the right venue and it has to be a long enough term exhibit to justify the expense of doing something like that. Yeah. Tra traveling with prints is no, you know, that's, that's quite a feat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, typically you have, you're, you're mounting them and, and then shipping them mounted. And, and these are all, you know, fairly high resolution, you know, these are all big, big files. So I, they, they print life size essentially. And so the, it's just, it's costly to move stuff around. Um, but I, you know, I hope to do a real physical exhibit of the prints at some point, um, maybe in conjunction with launching the book, we'll see that, that that's probably going to be the right time to do it. But in the meantime, um, conferences will invite me to come and, you know, exhibit the photos digitally, you know, on monitors. And, and that has been a really nice way to get the community to see them and interact with them you know, beyond just them being on the web. There's nothing like seeing a print in person, you know, uh, either through a book or, or my favorite, which would be as large as possible. Right. Um, and in person, especially if the artist is there, uh, there's just, there's just something about that human connection that you just can't get on the web as wonderful as the web is. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. The definition of the prints is, and I've, I've printed all of, all of these portraits, you know, I have, you know, I have all the work prints that I do because the printing is actually part of my editing process with, um, especially with black and white. Um, you know, it's, it, you can, you can only get the photograph to be, you know, so far on the computer. And then, you know, I have to, you know, I have to print it and sit with it. And, you know, sometimes I tell people, I say, it might be, it may be a month or two before you hear back from me on this, just because I'm traveling or something like that. But also, it's it's not a quick, it's not a quick edit. You know, these the portraits take some time to really sit with, and and you kind of have to marinate in the portrait, if you will, and <laughs> put it up on the wall, and you know, make sure you've got the tonality right, and you know, come back to it in a day or two, and you know, really just make sure it's it's dialed in right. And then these faces are so you know, the faces of the, of the subjects on that project are, are so awesome, um, that it's just, it's so nice to be able to get kind of right up to it. Whereas with a monitor, you know, you're not, you're not really going to get right up to it the way you can with a print. Nor will it necessarily do the photographic work any justice, right? 
I mean, monitors are pretty good, but yeah, it's just, it's not the same. It's not the same. Uh, I love hearing a little bit about your process there. It sounds to me like you're really bringing a lot of your heart and uh, your attention to showing every single person and every single face, I guess, bringing them to their very best for the experience that you had. Um, so I feel like that's a real, that's a really important thing to do for people. Uh, and I love hearing sort of that, that depth of attention that you're bringing to it. So, uh, thank you for doing that for, for everyone you're photographing, you know, it feels like we've all got stories to tell and, 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 and capturing people that way is, uh, a real gift really. Yeah. I mean, it just goes back to the 150%, you know, if you're going to get somebody to show up in front of your camera, you're going to go all the way and beyond just to make sure that that's the best portrait. Um, you know, and, and, and an honest portrait too, you know, um, you know, of them. And, and that's, you know, as a, as a portrait photographer, um, you know, that's a, that's always a balance you're trying to strike, which is making an authentic, you know, sort of honest portrait of somebody that reveals something, you know, that you get a little bit of a, of an idea who the person is or something about their personality through, through the, the portrait, um, as opposed to a highly stylized, you know, um, you know, rendition of somebody that may not really be, you know, how you saw the person in that moment. So that's always a balance you're trying to strike. Ah, uh, the life of photography, yeah. <laughs> it's such a great one. <laughs> um, can I ask you how you originally got into photography? Like, what was it about photography itself that kind of grabbed you and wouldn't let go? So I, you know, first picked up a camera really in high school. It started with the high school photography. And I would say I was pretty much hooked, you know, within the, you know, my, the first photography class I ever took in high school. You got the bug, right? <laughs> yeah. And my high school was really good. It had like a really good, uh, it had a, la a photo lab and it had a, a really good uh, set of staff and, and teachers and it had like multiple levels, you know, it had like a, the photo one and the photo two and the photo three, you know, courses. So you could really over, you know, the course of high school, you could be doing photography all through high school and, and continually learning new stuff, you know, the entire time. And, you know, I, I just, you know, I just got hooked in it and, you know, I would show up on the weekends to use the lab and the teacher would give me the key and, you know, sh she trusted me to, you know, be in there. And, you know, this is all film. So you were, you know, you were basically developing your own black and white film and then doing your own printing in the dark room. And which is such a special experience. If you've, if anyone's ever had that experience, it's like nothing else. Oh yeah. It's, I mean, I, I spent so many hours in the dark room, you know, in my teenage years and in my twenties, um, I don't miss it at all now just cause it's such a, yeah, we're lucky now. Right. But you know, that's when I sort of first got into it and I had a couple of friends that were really into it as well. So that really helped. And I was going to go to school after, you know, I was going to go to, um, after I graduated from high school, I, um, became a teaching assistant at the international center of photography in New York Nice. and TA'd you know, a few classes in exchange for getting access to their dark rooms. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I would, I would print there and then I would be a TA for visiting photographers that would do their classes at ICP. And I just thought, oh man, this is the greatest thing in the world. This is what I want to do. And, and when I went off to college, I, I almost went to art school. I kind of thought about it and, and, um, I wound up going to college and, and, um, at Trinity college in Hartford, Connecticut. And, their photo lab was just, it was just abysmal. So I petitioned the student government for a bunch of money and, and actually was able to build a new photo lab for them. Um, when, when I was an undergrad there. Oh, good for you. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, like I just, you know, this is what I was kind of, I was going to do, you know, I was just like total photo nerd, total darkroom nerd. And then I, started to get into computers uh because at that point i went you know trinity was one of the first schools in the country 
that had wired their um, residential dorms with Ethernet. Oh. So every student had Ethernet jack in their dorm room, and the school was hooked up to the internet via T1, which at the time was pretty good, you know, pretty good bandwidth back. This is the mid 90s, early and mid 90s. So I had started getting into computers because my best friend was at Dartmouth and we Dartmouth, you know, had this very forward thinking email system. They had developed their own email and the whole campus was electronic and everybody used email to communicate up there. And we wanted to send email back and forth to each other, you know, from, from Trinity to Dartmouth. So to do that, I had to get an account on, on the VAX, uh, you know, as this, you know, could, you know, basically mainframe that was in the computer center. <laughs> right. And to do that, I had to learn, you know, Unix commands, you know, cause the, the VAX ran, I don't remember what variant of Unix, but, um, you know, maybe it was system five or whatever it was. I see. So I can see how this is where it all begins. You can see this is exactly where it all begins. So, you know, I, I log in, you know, you know, I've got a Mac and I'm using, you know, uh, Telnet or, you know, a Telnet program to log into this VAX and type in, you know, these commands to change directories and open up, you know, um, the mail program, which at the time was, I think it was Pine was what I was using to start. And I just had to learn these Unix commands and, and I would get stuck and I would screw something up and I would have to go down to the computer center and I would have to bug the mail administrator to show me how to you know, flush my mail queue because I had screwed something up. And, you know, um, so I started to learn all these commands and and these funny programs. And he would give me these one-liners, you know, these one-line shell commands, you know, with pipes and stuff that would, you know, grip my mail spool and output it to a text file so I could read it because I had screwed something up and Pine wasn't recognizing it. Or I don't remember what it was at this point, but I had to learn all these programs. And I remember at that point thinking, like, who the hell comes up with the names of all these things? I mean, awk, <laughs> said, of course, pine. What the hell? Is, like, what does this all stand for? You know, like, what is what is all this? And it, I didn't. I kind of, you know, I, I mentally I look at that now as like, yeah, I remember having that thought, and then I kind of put it out of my mind. And you know, then you know, twenty years later, and I come back to this project, the Faces of Open Source. I'm photographing, you know. Al Aho of Auk and Peter Weinberger, <laughs> you know, like the people that created Auk, the people that wrote said, the people that, you know, Ken Thompson, you know, you know, you know, the the people that came up with the algorithms behind grep and, you know, send mail and all these Unix programs that, you know, I first interacted with, you know, just when I, you know, kind of got into the internet. What's most interesting to me about that as a tiny aside is that um, like most computer users these days never ever interact with any of those right although they were just so important for the timeline of computers and timeline of you know unix and the open source and all of that so so it's great for you to have a little bit of that, of that personal history. And now, you know, a few years later, you're getting to meet some of these people that, that must feel really cool. It was, it was cool. And in fact, with this project, that's kind of where I started. I, I started with the, the Unix, um, the folks at Bell Labs, um, that wrote Unix. And I started with that community and then I started photographing from there. I started photographing the BSD community and, then the Linux community, and I kind of went through operating systems, and then I you're like tracing history almost, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I figured I start I start at the beginning, and then kind of work my way down the family tree, um, and then out to these other communities. And it's been it's been it's been really really cool to sort of retrace some of my own personal computing history <laughs> through this project, and then meet meet some of the people you know who who are behind all this this tech that we. You know, I mean, as you say, most people don't even interact with it anymore, but what's amazing and what's totally astonishing to me and, and is so wonderful is that all of this tech is still living in their computers right under the glossy GUI. You know, if you're on a Mac, you know, it's, you know, you've, you've got BSD in there and, um, 
people are, or, or iOS or Android, you have Linux and, you know, all of this open source, all this tech and all of that fundamental Unix goodness, the, the design and the, the core programs that have since been rewritten with the GNU project and all this stuff, they're all living on everybody's computer. They may not be interacting with it directly, but they're all still there. And that's, that's such a cool, that's such a cool thing. <laughs> I find it really cool and fascinating, but at the same time, there's a hint of like, it's a bit tragic in some ways because it, it doesn't often get celebrated in the ways that perhaps it, it should, you know, uh, maybe it's unfair to expect every single computer user to want to celebrate, you know, the, the simplest of tools uh, that make everything run. But uh, wouldn't it be great if we could just all say thanks? I totally agree with you. I mean, and I think, you know, when I, when I started doing this project, you know, I think that was really one of the driving forces for me behind the project more, you know, in addition to the personal interest of just meeting a lot of these pioneers that have developed this was, you know, how do I get, the, how do we get this story out there? Right. Because without all of this technology and without all, all of the software specifically, you know, most of which is open source at this point, we wouldn't have any of this stuff that we're we're relying on now. And and you're absolutely right that most people don't know it's there. They don't know that they're every time they log into a website, they're relying not just on the open source nature of the web, the protocols that run the web, but they're using hundreds of open source programs every time the page is rendered. Mm -hmm. You know, there's hundreds of open source programs, you know. You know, tens of thousands of lines of code, you know, <laughs> at work, open source code at work, bringing that web page to them, pulling down that next email, um, you know, uh, transferring that file, you know, up, you know, to 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 the cloud. All of that is open source, and without that, you know, this would be a we'd be in a very different world, right? Oh yeah, I really felt like. It was important to get that story out there. And, and my thinking is, you know, as a photographer, what can I do? I can try to bring that story to life through photography and and specifically through the people, you know, and the human, the humans behind all this amazing code and, and put that on display so that people realize, hey, all this, I am relying on this. This is an amazing phenomenon that has that that is responsible for getting us to where we're at today. And it should be celebrated. It should be acknowledged and celebrated. And and hopefully the photography, you know, helps do that. That's 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 the goal of the project at this point. Yeah, it's your way of giving back with uh, the gifts that you have to open source, which is a really beautiful thing. Yeah, totally. And so I wanted to jump back to your history a little bit. Um, you were you were driving us through you know a little bit of your history early with some of the Unix stuff, uh, and I know that a lot of that leads into your discovering open source. So I wanted to kind of if you can walk us through that a little bit more. So you were just telling us you know that you were discovering Unix and um, playing with email, you know, the deep depths of email. <laughs> I was on the Vax send, sending email to Dartmouth. Um, you know, I, I got very interested in um, the internet, just being able to transfer information and being able to disseminate information. And, you know, I f started to discover this thing called Usenet, which is, you know, again, most people today, you know, wouldn't know what that was if they're just kind of getting familiar with the internet. But, you know, essentially the, this, you know, worldwide discussion, you know, news system, um, you know, uh, with topics on everything in the world, sort of the precursor to the web, if you will. And I started discovering that. And then, I, this thing called NCSA Mosaic uh, showed up, and I immediately saw, wow, this is this is really interesting. And and the first time I saw it, and the first time I saw a web page, I thought, oh, this is going to be a great way to show my photography. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. so, so I I was like, oh, this is great. I can't wait to get, put my photography up on a web page because. Up until that point, you know, I mean, and and you know this, you know, if you wanted to share your photography with somebody, you're in the dark room making pr making prints for people, 
And the way that the way that I print, you know, and 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 used to print and print today, even still, is it's very elaborate. But back then in the in the in the dark room, it's not about just putting the paper underneath and exposing, you know, <laughs> exposing the paper and you know, out comes the print like you're at a, a drugstore getting a print done. You know, it's it's an involved process of dodging and burning and manipulating the light as it comes out of the enlarger and doing contrast masks and you know, all the stuff today that you do in Photoshop, doing that on an analog way, waving your hand in front of the light. And you could never, I could never really truly get prints, you know, two prints to be identical. I mean, you would try, you would write down your instructions, but it would take a phenomenally long time. And every print was kind of a one of a, one of a kind piece of art. So if you wanted to give a print to somebody that was a big deal. If you wanted to share your photography and show it to somebody, you had to print it out. And wow, that could be an elaborate, really time-consuming process. So here, here comes the web and I'm thinking, great, I'll just scan in the print and I'll make a web page and I can just send the web page to people and they can look at my photography that way. And I was like, this is going to be the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I started talking to some friends about it and they're like, wow, we could, we could do a lot of cool stuff with this. We could like, you know, um, you know, provide information, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, poetry and writing. And we kind of got the idea to do a little magazine, you know, sort of like a student magazine. We were, I was at that point doing, you know, photography for the newspaper periodically as well, being photo geek. Um, but you know, we thought, well, we could get the we could get a whole magazine up on the web and we could get submissions from all of our friends at other colleges via email, because now that we know how to use that, um, they could just send in writing periodically and we could then publish this thing on the web. And, you know, I look back on that now and I'm like, wow, that was like, you know, maybe one of the best ideas I ever had at that point in time. It sounds kind of bold too at the time, right? Yeah. At that point in time. And we developed this, this little magazine that went up on the, that was the first magazine on the web. That's awesome. <laughs> and we would get contributions from all over the internet and we would publish this. And sometimes we'd put our photography up and sometimes it would be, you know, a, reported stories from journalist students. And, you know, it would just be a mix of, of different things. And we're having a good time with it. And, you know, all this while I'm figuring, well, I'm going to, I'm going to graduate from college and go back to New York and maybe I can get a job assisting somebody and, you know, start my photography career. So like the traditional photography, um, path, I suppose. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that was, that was always in the back of my mind was, you know, I I want to have my own studio. I want to live in a loft and be a photographer and, you know, you know, go down that, that New York city photographer path. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, one day I got an email from out of the blue from this guy who was the head of an ad agency in Silicon Valley, a guy by the name of Dave Carlick, who's a dear friend now. And has been a mentor to me since since that first email, and he wrote me saying, "Hey, I saw you know some of my guys sent around this magazine that you're doing. We're an internet, we're an ad agency that does all the internet work for the White House and Netscape and you know Chrysler and you know this is in sort of the mid '90s when nobody had a website." everybody was trying to get on board and he was in Silicon Valley and it was a small agency. It was a small sort of cutting edge boutique agency that was doing all of this really early web work. Um, it's an agency called Poppy Tyson. And he said, you know, we have, you know, this group in Silicon Valley doing this, but you know, you're in New York and I want to set up a whole New York operation. You know, can you come in and, you know, can we talk? Wow. And so I go to go in New York. I go in for this interview and we're talking and he's like, okay, show me your, you know, show me your, show me your website. And of course, you know, I couldn't, you know, of course, uh, you know, anytime you're doing a live demo, you can't get anything to work. So of course, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't pull up the website. So I'm just, Oh no. <laughs> right. So I'm just like describing it to him and I'm like, this is what it is and this is how it is. And, you know, we'll look at it later, but you know, for some reason we can't get it on the computer. 
anyway, so he's like, well, this is really great. He's like, you know, I, I want to hire you to, you could come in and, and do all this interactive stuff. And, you know, you're in an ad agency and it's this creative environment. And, you know, I think you really love it. And I was like, oh my God, wow. Somebody wants to pay me to do creative work on this new platform <laughs> called the internet, which is like going to be, you know, at that point I was just like, this is going to be the biggest thing in the world. And I was like, absolutely. This sounds, this sounds great. And so I, you know, I went for an interview there when, you know, I thought, well, maybe I should interview somewhere else. And, um, I had gotten another email from the guys at time at, uh, time Inc. Cause they were an early, they had an early internet presence. And I, I went in to interview there and I didn't really like, you know, I didn't really like the, the folks over there as much as, as Poppy Tyson and, and, and working for Dave. And so I, took this job working for, for Poppy Tyson doing this early internet work in the early nineties. And that just took me on this, this whole different trajectory. And I spent 20 years doing internet tech ventures. Um, and photography was kind of on, on the side where I could fit it in. And so I, I described to my, you know, and that was up until, you know, a little over 10 years ago, I decided it was time to get back to photography. So I always joke to people that photography is my first love and, and second career, <laughs> um, having spent, you know, 20 years doing start internet and technology startups in, in New York and Silicon Valley. Um, and that's really where I got really inundated with open source. That's really, you know, kind of the first the, my first exposure to open source was was after I left Poppy Tyson. I I in the the heyday of the dot com bubble, um, I had started a company you know that did you know analytics, web analytics, you know, very similar to a you know sort of a, an online SaaS service, very similar to what Google Google has now with Google Analytics. Sounds like you're a bit earlier than they were. Yeah, way, way earlier than Google. No, there was no <laughs> Google at that point. And it was in the sort of heyday of the bubble. And we raised a bunch of money. And, you know, this was going to be, you know, this big, this big thing. And I was really into, you know, the data and how people were using these websites. And that was really fascinating to me. So we started this company and we we're trying to get this thing off the ground. And, you know, this was in 99, you know, literally like couldn't have been like, it was the best timing to raise a bunch of money, but then it was the worst timing in the world <laughs> to operate a company. And, you know, there was no cloud, there was no nothing. I mean, to get these businesses off the ground back then, you literally needed tens of millions of dollars in, in capital to purchase hardware, stick it in a data center. I mean, luckily at that point, the co-location model of co-locating instead of building out your own data center, you could just rent some space and and, and co-locate your equipment in someone else's data center. So luckily, like we didn't need, you know, a hundred million dollars to build a data center network. We could just co-locate, but you still needed tens of millions of dollars to purchase storage from EMC and servers from Sun and and database licenses from Oracle and you know all of this this huge iron to to crunch these numbers and to do data processing at that point. So we raised this money and we purchased all this equipment. And then when the dot-com bubble burst and we needed to raise more money, you know, we couldn't. And, you know, we kind of wound up having to sell sell the business, um, which we 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 wound up doing that and sold it to a company called uh, Search Engine, uh, ironically enough, um, called LookSmart out in San Francisco. But you know the 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 funny story I always tell about my first exposure to open source was while we're building this web analytics company, we we purchased all this big iron from Sun. We purchased literally like this thing that looks like you know, you know I mean you, I'm sure you've seen Star Wars or you know those movies or any of the Star Wars movies. They all have the same thing where where Obi Wan Kenobi goes and like has to shut off the the you know force field of the Death Star so that that the Luke Skywalker and the crew can come in and blow it up. And he goes out on like, you know, this parapet and there's this 
big like <laughs> monolith thing and he's got to pull these latches you know on like four sides and it's this hulking like tower yeah we had we we had to buy one of those you know i always joke like <laughs> that's what we had to buy to run that business did you have a death star to put it into as well or what? it was literally it looked like a death star it looked like the control panel of the death star it was this son's biggest computer their E10K, it's infamous computer. It was so big, it required a forklift to get it into the, you know, the the data center. And, <laughs> you know, it was just massive. And we bought it because, you know, it was like at that point, you know, running lots of small computers and and clustering them, you know, wasn't as, you know, that wasn't an obvious um easy pattern to use at that point. It was much easier for us to just have one big computer with lots of CPUs. So we decided we would buy this big computer with lots of CPUs and we'd run Oracle on it. And Oracle had promised through their software they had that their database you could do you could run a query across multiple CPUs. This product they had called Oracle Parallel Query, which probably cost us 50 grand just to purchase the license for that thing. Oh, man. <laughs> In hindsight, it's all so funny. You're, I'm just shaking my head as I tell this story. <laughs> you know, we're thinking, oh, great, that's that's how we're going to get the throughput we need for these data warehousing queries is we'll run this Oracle, you know, software across all these multiple CPUs and this big sunbox, and we'll have enough power to do all the data warehousing queries we need to do to run the business. That must have seemed pretty exciting at the time because it sounds like you're combining some pretty high tech of of the time, right? Did that is that the feeling you got? It was. It was. It was super exciting. I mean, you know, to be able to put all this tech to work and, you know, in service of of running a what was, you know, what later be called SaaS, a SaaS product, you know, instead of like shipping people CDs and having them install it, we would run all the hardware and they would just ship us the data would come to us and we would do all the processing on our end. So it was like a, it was a lot of new stuff. It was like a whole new world of the internet. It was a whole new world of, of analyzing websites, all sorts of new technology. And we were so excited and we had all this money from venture capitalists and all this stuff. And we get all this stuff in the data center and we install the software and we start running it through its paces and we just can't get it to work. Oh, no. <laughs> we, it's just the Oracle software, just it won't use more than one CPU per query. So the promise they've made isn't coming true. The promise they made is not coming true. And of course, you know, we've paid more money than God for a support contract. So, you know, our my CTO is on the phone and we're trying to work with them and we escalated and escalated and escalated through their system. And, and ultimately it just comes back to like, yeah, that's a bug. That's a bug. We're, we're going to have to get a fix for that, you know, out to you. And we're like, okay, great. When, when can we expect, you know, how many days will that take? And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not talking. That's the wrong days is not the right metric, to, you know, the right, the right way to measure this, you know, like, oh no, this will come out in the next release cycle. And, you know, that could be, you know, weeks, it could be, it could be months. And we're like, what, you know, like, are you kidding me? Like we've got our whole stack is you guys promised us this would work and we bought all this stuff. And, you know, of course we're just like this naive, you know, group of 20 somethings trying to make this all, make all this work. But it sounds like your business was sort of relying on that function. We're like, Jesus, what are we going to do? Like we're, we're kind of screwed on this now. So my CTO is like, okay, look, this isn't going to work. We're not going to be able, we're going to have to use the Oracle database differently. We're going to have to do the data processing off of this thing. Uh, you know, I've started experimenting with this thing called Linux. And I think we could just get some, We, you know, at this point we'd spend all our money on this E10K. Right. So we're like, okay, well, we could just get some really inexpensive computers and try to use Linux in a cluster to do the data processing. When he first suggested it, did that seem like kind of depressing because you've, you know, focused all your attention on this dream product and here you are maybe putting together a few, like, it's, it sounds like clearly lesser computers. Well, if, you know, it was more like, oh my God, I hope that works. <laughs> right. It was more like, oh, I, my fingers are crossed. Like, you know, this is, this is of course also like, I'm like, well, how much is Linux going to cost us? You know, and you know, all this. And he's like, no, 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 Linux is, Linux is free. It's, it's open source. And you know, we don't have to pay for that. And I'm like, oh, okay. 
I'm like, but is it going to work? <laughs> you know, and, well, it's a, it's a valid question, right? And his answer to me, and you know, I'll never forget it was, you know, if it doesn't, we can fix it. And I was like, oh, right. I'm like, right, right. Cause we're screwed waiting for Oracle here. And, um, so that's what we did. We, we bought a bunch of, um, you know, commodity, you know, com- you know, commodity computers and, um, Intel computers, and we ran Linux on it, you know, and, and we did our data processing that way. And we, we used one CPU at a time in this big hulking Death Star of a, of a Sun computer for, for running the, for, for the database. And you know the the ironic thing about that entire experience, as as kind of crazy and depressing as it was, as we're, you know, as the bubble is bursting all around us, and we're realizing, God, you know, we've like, you know, we we can't raise more money for the business, and you know, it's costing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to run. You know, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to sell the, sell the company, and you know, you know, um, you know, because of the dot com had had burst, at the, the bubble had burst at that point. And I remember we're, we're, it was the last couple of days of closing down our office, which was down on Wall Street. And we're just, you know, kind of tidying everything up and, you know, getting the space ready, you know, getting all of our stuff out of the space. And this FedEx guy comes and, and starts knocking on the door. And I'm like, oh, huh, I wonder what this is. You know, like, I wonder who's, you know, I did, we haven't ordered anything. You know, we're like days away from just turning out the lights on this office because we had sold the company to, to look smart in San Francisco and all the operations were moving out to San Francisco. And I'm like, Oh, what's this? I wonder what this FedEx is. And I go and I sign for the FedEx and, and I open it and it's literally a 25 CD ROM patch kit from Oracle with the, with the fix (laughs) for the parallel server bug that we had filed eight months before. (laughs) <laughs> well, it did come as they promised. <laughs> it finally came. You know, it was like, it was like so little, so late, so irrelevant. Like we had moved on so far beyond that, but it was just so ironic that here we are, like we couldn't get the tech to work. We're waiting and waiting. We have to give up on it. We go to open source and like one of the last days of the history of the company, eight months too late the bug fix comes from the commercial software provider. (laughs) And I just remember thinking, I'm holding this stuff in my hand right before I threw it in the garbage. And I'm saying to myself, I will never, ever, one, make, you know, buy Oracle software again. But two, I just won't ever make that mistake to be beholden to a commercial software vendor for running, for running anything on my business. Because you literally, you can, you could go bankrupt. Like it could bankrupt you. It could be like the fatal flaw in your technology stack. And you could then be, you know, completely handcuffed on, on dealing with it. And that was a hard lesson to learn. Um, You know, it all worked out in the end. We sold the company and it was all fine, but wow, what a lesson. And that was the beginning of, you know, another 15 years of running everything on open source, every venture I ever did every company I ever worked for after that, it was all open source. And, you know, me convincing people, no, we're not going to renew that Oracle license. No, we're not going to buy more sun equipment, <laughs> you know? And it was like, I was like Dr. No for 10 years in these companies, getting people weaned off of this commercial proprietary software, you know, and into, into using open source. So that was, that was how I got into it. That was my, that was my, um, <laughs> that was my indoctrination by fire, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> what a powerful moment and turning point for you, right? And I could see why it's such a deep part of you now um, in trying to both celebrate it and uh, and and sharing it with others. <laughs> That's an amazing story. <laughs> Well, listeners, we're going to take a tiny break here for now. Stay tuned for part two coming later this week, where Peter and I explore more topics like open source photography workflows, artificial intelligence, and the future of photography. 